All right, welcome. Here we are back three years since the last time we had a conference. So welcome to the Learning Ideas Conference 2022, um, which is our first hybrid event. So good to see many old faces back and many new faces. So for those of you I haven't met, I'm David Gronlick on the conference chair. Great to see all of you. Great to see the room filled and, you know, almost feels like the before times in some ways. So in some ways, totally not. Uh, so I want to just welcome everyone to the conference, talk through a couple of things, um, just to make sure you're familiar with how things are going to work. We have about 100 talks total, including all the parallel sessions. Um, three great keynotes, uh, Ian, you'll see in a moment, uh, Ryan Baker and Antonella Poche. Um, Antonella is here and Ryan will be here tomorrow. Uh, panel discussions, demos, and, and all kinds of things. So we're really looking forward to this um, as our first hybrid conference. Uh, if you're in person, our team is outside in the reception area. You uh, presumably have stopped off there in order to actually get this far. So you have met our team. Um, stop by if you have questions. Um, everything is going to be on this floor except for drinks later and lunches on Thursday and Friday. So um, all the rooms, if you haven't seen them yet, you'll see them um, pretty, pretty easily. Um, when we get to parallel sessions, track one will be in here. Track two is in the boardroom, which is back and to the left. Uh, the restrooms are also back and to the left, so, you know, choose carefully, but pick them all. Uh, room three is back and to the right, and then um, the other sessions for tracks four, five, six, and seven are kind of lined up in this uh, big room here, and those are generally online talks, but they're all being broadcast. So everything here is being broadcast to the online audience. Every virtual talk is being shown here, so treat them all as, as you'd like. You'll be able to chat, you'll be able to participate um, as much as you can. As you probably have discovered by now, there's free wireless access, open, um, use the Columbia University internet and just connect and do all that you need. So no password required. You know, once they let you in, you're legitimate. Um, kind of went through where the rooms are. Um, as we get into the parallel sessions, each session will always have someone handling the technology and the online event system and somebody handling the session sharing, introducing talks, um, asking questions, all that kind of thing. So that's where we are and where we're going to be. So uh, we have the conference event site that you have an email about. So there's the public site and then there's the event site where you can log in uh, and make sure you've received the initial password with that. If not, check with the desk. Um, and you can network, you can do a couple things and you can do some online chatting and some other stuff. So um, each session has also two links, one with the video if you're off site and want to watch, another one that just gets you to the chat if you feel like chatting while you're while you're here, so. Okay, so we're trying to make this a hybrid event that everybody is part of. Session timing, session chairs, and the parallel sessions will remind everybody five minutes left, one minute left, all the usual stuff, so. Programming note, if we have any presenters who aren't able to make it, and we don't have any of those at this moment, uh, that session will just be, that talk slot will just be skipped, right? So if there's a 2 to 2.30, that will just be a blank slot in that room and then pick back up at 2.30, so. Some conferences do it a little differently. So here we're staying with, the, staying with the times that we have as they are planned. Okay, feel free to tweet about the conference. Try to check out our conference team. People will do things, so all kinds of stuff. So I'm gonna speak for a few minutes and then turn you over to Ian before we go. So this is our first hybrid conference. The online world and the real world are kind of blending together. We are you know, in a hybrid world entirely these days. Um, in a lot of the ways, this is really, really nice, right? People can interact from here and from anywhere. And, you know, it's not always the easiest thing to say, hey, I'm just going to take my week and come to New York. It's a great thing to do, and I hope all of you do it every year and bring lots of other people back with you. But, you know, not everyone has, you know, has the possibility of doing that. And here we're able to accommodate people who can't make it or people who are unable to make it and keep them participating kind of as, as much in the same way as we can. So people can collaborate and work without being in the same location. A lot of us have worked remotely a lot over the past few years and continue to do it. Um, you can always communicate asynchronously. I remember the days where you couldn't really find people unless they entered their phone. Now you can always send emails, obviously you could do that before, and you can communicate synchronously through Zoom, through video, through all kinds of things. Along with that, everyone's a content creator, right? Everybody can post anything, anytime, almost anywhere. In some ways, that's really good. It opens up the world. In some ways, it changes things in more dangerous ways, right? Um, a lot of things become about popularity, 
right? The most, you know, the thing that gets the most impressions is the thing that's going to get, you know, get the best known, and it's not necessarily the best work, right? So we lose a lot of editorial capabilities and features. So there's some things to think about in the world that we're in. Um, you know, the most popular ideas aren't necessarily the best. So here we are in this mixed reality world. Here's a little scene from a potential future online learning uh, course with an AI coach. Doesn't quite exist yet. Um, we can create better and better educational experiences. Right? We have new technology with AR and VR. We have some AI techniques that are really, really helpful where we can put people in positions to have very human experiences online if we do it right. right? Including a lot of the self-paced work, right? Like, you know, my own background is significantly in self-paced meaning you're working with, you know, you and the computer, maybe nobody else is there, but in a very human way. You have a customer come up in video and you have to help them. You have a complex sales situation you have to think through. You have difficult decisions to make. The way the system is designed treats you as a, respect, a respected professional person or a respected student, not as, you know, here's what you need to do, click next, take this test, wrong. None of those are part of a good self-paced experience, as all of you know, which is, I think, why you're here. So, so many opportunities to do things on a large scale, create really human experiences that can scale up. And that's a lot of, I think, what this conference is about. We have the opportunity to continue to create better and better educational experiences and reach a large audience. And at a meta level, you know, we can help people make better decisions. Right? A lot of existing in the world today is about making better decisions. What do I believe? What do I not believe? How do I know? Lots of people are telling me different things. What am I reading? What am I seeing? Um, the more we can put people in position where educational experiences are about decision making and critical thinking and discussion and all of the right things rather than memorization, the better off we're going to be, um, you know, as, as from the educational standpoint and from the society standpoint. So to me, that's a lot of what this conference is about. It's, you know, it's creating and developing a future of learning that you know, doesn't just rely on the past. It doesn't just rely on some of the methods that maybe became popular because they're a little bit easier or because they work well in an in-person environment when you only have so many people who are teachers, right? There's only so many people, you know, if you have a big room, there's only so many things you can do. But you build a really interesting you know, educational experience where people can explore things, make difficult decisions, have an AI coach maybe helping them out as we, you know, as we get there, and that can scale to, to millions and be available to everybody and accessible as well. So I'm excited to talk about all those things and more over the next three days, and it's great to have the groups here both online and in person, and I'm kind of looking at that as one big group. So what I'm going to do without taking more of your time is get us to our first keynote, who I'm delighted to have here again. Ian was with us uh, once several years ago in our earlier incarnation, and it's great to have him back uh, here in New York and at this conference. Uh, Ian Bogos, I think many of you know, um, can't fit all of his credentials on one page, but he's a professor of computer science and engineering and professor and director of the program in Film and Media Studies at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, he's a well-known author and award-winning game designer. He is the founding partner at Persuasive Games LLC, uh, contributing editor at The Atlantic, which is where you may well have seen his work if you have not seen it elsewhere. Uh, author, co-author of 10 books, and we've got the titles here, and there's so much more I could say, but what I would rather do is turn it over to Ian. So if you'd help me, please welcome Ian Bogas. So it's great to have you here. All right. How's everybody doing? Oh, don't make me do the thing. How's everybody online doing? Yeah, we can't, we can't hear them. It's interesting. It's a different social experience. I'm really glad to be here again. Um, I, f I feel short, which is a common feeling for me, but I'm just going to adjust this mic a little bit um, and get my notes up. Okay, great. Um, I'm excited to talk to you today. We'll see how this goes. Um, this is material I've been working on kind of over the, the pandemic period. And I was just telling David before, like, I haven't really attended an event like this in like two and a half years. I've given talks, you know, locally and online. Um, but this experience, which I used to do all the time, and which I love doing and, and still do, I, I think, I guess we'll see, um, is new or newly different uh, in a way. I think that's relevant uh, for the material I want to talk through with you. Um, that's enough like prolegomena and I'll, I'll get started here. A little over 25 years ago, I worked in the tech industry before the dot-com uh, bust. 
And among uh, the other projects that I, that I worked on, I was a member of the team that built the first iteration of Lexus.com, the, the, the car company website. Uh, and among other things that we did there at the time, we put up a golfing game. And I, I guess the idea we had in mind was that if you, know, if, if you were someone who was going to buy an aggressively mild luxury car, then you probably also liked golf. Uh, and that example was, uh, was one specimen of what would come to be known as, as advert games, which I've done a lot of work in over the years. And sitting there in front of this golfing game on this car website at a time when no one knew what any of these things were for, I got this, this notion, this sort of idea in my head. And that idea was that computer games and simulations had a, a potential life beyond entertainment. They had a potential life in business and in education and in politics and in more. And admittedly, that wasn't an, a new idea uh, back then. It wasn't even a new idea to me. I remembered you know, playing SimCity and Oregon Trail and all the rest. Uh, but things were different at this moment in time that I'm recalling. Games then in the mid-90s meant Doom or Super Mario. And so I let that idea stir around in my brain for a while. And a few years later, I started a company to make uh, such games. And we made a lot of them. We made games about airport security and workers' rights and tort reform and fast food restaurant operations and hotel management. And even at one point, a uh, pandemic flu. Not a lot of good such a game did. And, and then I wrote a book that shared its name with the studio about the idea that games could make arguments. Uh, and they could do so by presenting these playable models of how the world worked, or how it might work, or how it should work. And all this happened before the social internet existed at all, which is kind of a hard thing even to remember, even for those of us uh, who were there, because we've become so acclimated to whatever it is that we do online today. And I believed at this time, I believed, and I think with some ground, that smart, thinky games could become a major form of human exchange. And at, at the zenith of that ambition, as I was promoting uh, one of our games, the first official uh, video game for a US presidential candidate back in 2003, I remember telling a news outlet that was interviewing me about this idea that come the next election cycle, which would have been 2008 projected into the future then, come the next election cycle, I surmised, every major candidate would have like their own PlayStation game outlining their platform and what it would feel like to live in America under their proposed policies. Uh, so that didn't happen. Um, in, instead, all those people got Facebook pages and YouTube channels. And you, you kind of know how the rest turned out in terms of politics. And for games, well, you know, specimens like the one Look, the ones that I was making at the time and continued to make and still make, they have persisted to some extent. But the media ecosystem moved on. It went elsewhere. Uh, and my kind of games uh, became, really became curiosities, not culture. So all of that and more led me to ask new questions. I had conceived games, I had conceived of games seriousness as being a function of their content, of what they were about. Uh, and even if that aboutness was produced by these new kinds of, of computer models, which I thought was important, it changed the way that we could make statements uh, about things, um, it was still nevertheless the aboutness that was central. That was the novelty, making games beyond entertainment. But then I started to wonder, what if that, what if I'd been mistaken? What if the power of games came from their nature rather than, or at least more so, than their content. And that led me to look more seriously at, at play, the mode of activity that games share with many other kinds of devices and systems, from guitars to steering mechanisms. Uh, and I had this idea that you know, play was in anything, that you could learn to play anything, which was what I argued in the book I would eventually write on this topic. And that meant that anything whatsoever had the power to bear 
the meaning and the delight uh, and the fun and the engagement uh, of games. And the trick uh, that I argued for in this, in this book and in this work came from uh, externalizing the joy that we derived from play to the object of play rather than thinking it comes from you, it, 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 its subject. That you, you play when you deliberately work the materials of the material world in concert with their given constraints. And we'll come back to that a little bit more. Now, I don't know what this book is, but it, it, there were parts of me that, that wanted it to be and that still wish it were a, a kind of self-help book. And it, it's really hard to write that kind of book because what the market and what the reader really wants is a kind of simple answer, a recipe for a solution. And I'd spent this whole previous part of my career arguing against simple answers. That was the reason I got interested in games as learning tools in the first place, was that they could complexify topics and ideas. But what we really want, especially now, is like, please just tell me, just tell me what to do, right? And it's not an unreasonable request. And it's a question that I've struggled with in the years since I started working on games, certainly, and then in the years since I started working on play after working on games, uh, even as I, I tried, and I think succeeded to some extent, in making this gospel I've been arguing for a part of my own daily life. It's one thing to theorize about play philosophically, but it's quite another to put it in practice. Like, how do you learn to do it? And how do you put it to use in domains such as learning? So I'm gonna spend uh, the rest of our time together riffing on these questions, uh, perhaps, perhaps failing to answer any of them. Uh, and then trying to justify that failure in a gratifying way that you'll, you'll, you'll leave the room feeling uh, chin, chin scratches about, okay? Two, it's already two, almost two and a half years ago, two winters ago last February, I took a trip to Southern California uh, with my daughter. And it was the last flight that I had taken before the, the pandemic uh, uh, descended and sent us all into our domiciles. And as if it, it were like kind of offering a, a personalized diagnosis of that catastrophe that was forthcoming, the, the trip itself was something of a disaster, especially the part that involved transit, that involved airplanes. We, we got delayed like four hours outbound, and I don't remember why, who knows. Uh, and then the return trip was this, uh, you know, this late night kind of red eye type flight already, um, which started more auspiciously. You know, I was excited about uh, being in the world in a way that became difficult to do. I, I was at the John Wayne Airport uh, in Orange County and I purchased a large bag of unholy snacks called Skittles Dips, which are Skittles candy coated in yogurt, uh, something you can look into on your own time, and, and, and a copy of uh, Uncanny Valley, uh, Anna, Anna Weiner's memoir about working in Silicon Valley. So I was equipped, I was prepared to work the materials of the material world during my flight. So we did what you do uh, on the airplane. We sat and the plane uh, hurtled us through the air at three quarters the speed of sound, a, a marvel we didn't notice, let alone remark on. And uh, uh, food or the in-flight simulation of food uh, was provisioned. And I remember very distinctly for some reason, I remember recalling, thanks to the food, a, a previous flight I'd had um, back during those dot-com days, uh, back to California from the East Coast. Um, when I was still in graduate school, actually, and I, I was like still kind of impoverished, and I didn't have airline status, and I was seated so far back in the plane that by the time the food service arrived, th there had been a choice. The choice um, but, of chicken or pasta had been reduced to a default choice of pasta or pasta because the chicken had been fully depleted. And um, just to give you a sense of the, the, the state of mind I, I was in at the time, um, I was so sort of addled with philosophy and critical theory that I thought, ah, lo, um, this is the perfect object lesson in the philosopher Benedict Spinoza's uh, pantheism, which he, he described uh, with this Latin phrase, Deus siwe not, not natura. Siwe is, if you know Latin, is this, this strange conjunctive disjunction that means this or that, but like either one, it doesn't matter which. So God or nature, which is at the heart of Spinoza's thinking, but either one, they're the same, and chicken or pasta, or either you take what you can get, which is just an airline meal, which of course you don't get at all anymore. Anyhow, anyway, 
Our flight began its descent. Oh, we were still living in Atlanta at the time. I was working at Georgia Tech. It, it began its, its descent in the usual way, over, you overshoot the, the Hartsfield-Jackson Airport from the west and then execute this wide counterclockwise turn to enter the approach queue. I'd done it so many times before. It was so familiar. And it was nice that something was going well. Uh, except then it, it wasn't anymore. The, 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 the turbines wind up and we started rising fast and turning to the north. Something was clearly wrong. But it wasn't actually anything interesting. Uh, uh, what had happened is regional weather had created backups that necessitated an air traffic hold in Atlanta. And our aircraft had fuel sufficient to wait out the hold, but insufficient to have waited it out because commercial airliners are required to maintain a minimum reserve of fuel at all times in case something goes further wrong. So we got diverted to Chattanooga, just to the north, uh, uh, to refuel. As with many, many problems, the problem turned out not to be the problem so much as the problems the problem created. Uh, and the explanation that I just recounted to you, we didn't get that right away, of course. You never do. You're like, what's happening? I don't know. Nobody knows. We're just waiting. We're sitting on an airplane. Uh, that, only, that only arrived later after the passengers began just like v kind of vibrating in panic. Was something like mechanically wrong? Were we in physical danger? Would they miss... Uh, their connections in Atlanta, a major international uh, hub, they become stranded, or, or, or at a more, like would the granola bar that was handed out earlier, would that be sufficient to last to the next phase of whatever journey uh, was ahead of us? So we landed and we refueled in Chattanooga, and that part of the process took just endlessly longer than anyone might have hoped or, or, or predicted. Uh, and by now it was like, it was really late, and the weather wasn't great, it was foggy and, and, and drizzly, um, but we were finally ready to go except we weren't ready to go. The, the airport in Chattanooga is small, and it wasn't used to receiving uh, Boeing 757s, and nobody knew how to disconnect the taxi tow bar from this particular aircraft, except for one guy. And he had long since gone home from the day. He lived 40 minutes away, and he was driving back to the airport right now through the sleet, uh, no doubt thrilled uh, with the fate uh, that awaited him. So. You know, hysteria erupts in the cabin at this point, and you can hear passengers plotting and planning, calling hotels. They're ready to abandon ship. Um, but there was really kind of no point. The weather problems in the region that had caused us to be stranded, they had also already filled up the nearby lodging with throngs of locally stranded uh, passengers. And I did the same. I was tapping furiously on my phone. I thought, maybe I can rent a car and drive the two hours uh, back to Atlanta. But of course, the car rentals were also picked over, and the lots were going to close anyway. So like it was a gambit that just wasn't worth the risk. Would they be open by the time I got there? And then that was a risk that would be get even more risk, because I'd have to somehow pilot it safely through the ice and also stay awake uh, while doing so in the dark. But even despite all this, um, exploring the options helped us identify the best one, or at least the one that we chose which was to do nothing and sit there in our airplane seats. And that was great, because that was the default. And eventually we got home, and uh, it was like eight hours later than we expected, uh, and our lives continued uh, minimally changed until a global pandemic disrupted everything the next month. So my, my daughter who was with me on, on the plane um, is the same daughter who, years before this, had inspired the opening anecdote uh, for this book I wrote uh, on play. And it's an anecdote I'll, I'll recount because there's no reason to think you've encountered this, this book before. Um, I was running an errand at, the, at a local uh, shopping mall. I was still living in Atlanta at the time. Uh, and she was very young. I was in a hurry. I don't remember what I was doing or why. It must not have been important. I remember that it was the weekend. The mall was crowded. And this was a time when we, we kind of like didn't mind being in crowds. You know, We didn't freak out about that. Um, I just wanted to get out. I just wanted to leave. Um, but my, 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 my daughter was young. She was like four years old. And um, she was clutching my hand as I was kind of dragging her through the throngs of shoppers. And I was moving too fast for her little legs. So she was taking you know, multiple steps to keep up with me. And as I walked, I felt that. I felt her quick steps between steps. I felt her like tugging me back and pulling me in other directions, and I, I was kind of like irritated, like, come on, like, you know, even, even though it wasn't her fault. And, and I finally looked down and I saw what she was doing, what I had interpreted as this sort of dallying, 
was that she was staring straight down at her shoes, timing her, her steps so that they would fall within uh, the, the, the big square boundaries of, of the white ceramic tiles uh, lining the mall floor. And, and the thing that I'd interpreted as these pulls and tugs had really been the shifts of her weight as she attempted to avoid violating the, the grout lines while I pulled her through the crowds. And you know, you'll immediately recognize that what she was doing this sort of like variation of the, the step on a crack game, which is actually a, a ritual that began as a, a Victorian a superstition, only later developed into a children's, games, children's game for sidewalks. But my daughter didn't know about any of that. She had no familiarity with that cultural history. She just kind of reinvented it, rediscovered it on her own, but, but she added something to it too, because instead of just looking where she was going, she was subject to my, uh, to my cadence and my movement. I was leading her by the hand, and that meant she didn't have to look where she was going. She was just kind of on this ride. And all of those limitations uh, created new freedoms. They allowed her to focus on her feet rather than on the human obstacles uh, tumbling toward her, and through this this exercise, which was made out of the materials that she just happened to find around her in the moment, uh, she found this, this, this new way to find meaning in a situation where I had seen none. It was just an irritation. So it, like, it may seem weird to call a, a diversion from an errand or a, a long, terrible day of flight delays creative exercises. <laughs> But I, I want you to believe with me for a minute that it's not wrong to do so, that creative practice of all kinds, from artistic inspiration to just suffering through a mundane disaster and somehow making your way to the other end of it, it doesn't arise from uh, the intrinsic self, like fueled by the molten core of one's personality, whether that's through inventiveness or grit. Rather, creativity emerges from a negotiation between a creator, which can just mean an actor, an individual, and an initial vision or an initial context even, and then a set of, of material limitations that help lead that idea from abstraction to concreteness. Creativity, in other words, is always found under conditions. And to seek the novelty that, that gives birth to meaning in any situation, you have to embrace those conditions rather than uh, mistrusting or, or rejecting them. And that's just, it's like already really hard to do that under the best of circumstances. Uh, or even under the ones that we legitimately construe as creative, like you know, writing a book or painting a painting or parenting a child or doing any of these things. It, it's no mean feat, you know, but there are at least feats that, that people recognize, that enjoy recognition as such. It's much, much harder to see more mundane circumstances as opportunities for uh, creativity and constraint to operate and to, to kind of give birth to, to, to liveliness, you know, such as negotiating the dumb reality of a flight delay. But the weird thing is this sort of stuff, this dumb flight delay, these circumstances are just far more common and plentiful than the traditionally creative, delightful ones where we imagine the meaning in our lives uh, arises. Now back in the mall, uh, my daughter was just a child who taught me something that I really wouldn't unlock until years later about creativity and constraint and play and fun. Uh, but on the plane, she was someone else. She was an aspiring um, uh, high school graduate instead of a bored preschooler. And we'd gone to Southern California scouting uh, colleges. My, my daughter was interested in an acting conservatory program, but specifically in screen acting, which doesn't really exist as a program of study much of anywhere. Like we visited Chapman University in Orange, California, which has this amazing uh, film and television production facility with multiple sound stages and Foley stages and theaters. And then it has this theater program that's sort of crammed into a cinder block basement of an ancient a hall. Uh, a guy named uh, Nico Skordakis gave us a campus tour. And uh, <laughs> given the, the, the <laughs> I don't even know, this is probably what comes up when you Google Nico Skordakis. Um, Given the high, pers he told us this story, he was like, given the high personal and financial cost of medical residency and fellowship, uh, he had recently settled on dentistry as a sensible successor to his biology major. And, and you know, like that is a great example of working the materials, uh, of the material world 
uh, too. Then we visited USC, which is my alma mater and obviously home to a stellar cinema program that you may have heard of. And it also has, a, 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 I guess, what I call an extant stage acting program. And the cinema program kind of ignores it because it has this really sophisticated relationship with SAG-AFTRA. So anyway, like things were like feeling kind of bleak for our prospects. And my daughter also was in a particular situation like everyone is. She was a good and conscientious student, but she was never like a terribly willing one. And the traditional four-year residential uh, college experience, which is the product that we sell at, at Washington University where I teach now, and it's certainly what they sell here at Columbia where we're standing. And it's also the one that her older brother had partaken of with, with great glee at an institution uh, not quite as, as, as august as, as the previous two, but no less expensive, I assure you. And in general, which like American culture kind of clings to as a structuring force, even for those who will, who will never have access uh, to its spoils, all of that was just kind of not of, of great interest to her in the first place. So it was hard to see a match between her desires, her capacities, and the structures and expectations the world had placed before her. But those structures and expectations represented, for us, you know, they still represented the very pinnacle uh, of privilege, as, as they do for all of us in, in this room uh, today. But we couldn't really engage with those matters at the time. It was just, we didn't know what to do with all this stuff. And so instead, we spent two days at Disneyland instead. Um, <laughs> And that was an act that I'll tell you, it seemed prescient given the lockdown that emerged uh, uh, soon after. And, that was, and, and then we sat on an airplane for 13 hours. So the day after my daughter and I finally got home that, that February two, two plus years ago, I opened my email to find a note from a young woman of a similar age in a similar position. And, and I was circumscribed in her situation in, in a different way. Here's what she wrote. I, I recently read your book, Play Anything, and damn, what a book, she opened. So like, okay, like I'm, I'm listening. The idea of getting out of your head and doing things for themselves sounded really great, she continued. So I tried to put it to practice. And on the bright side, I did succeed at turning, brushing, and getting ready in my night routine and traffic into play. It worked, and I'm having fun. I used to hate waking up, and now it's game, yada, yada. And at this point, I'm feeling like pretty good. Anytime you get fan mail, you're like, yeah. Um, and then I keep reading. Uh, but now I tried this for my college work. Before, when I'd start studying, I'd get really uncomfortable and seek some desperate distraction. So now your book said, treat the thing for what it is with absurd respect. But I don't understand how I should conjure this feeling of respect on demand. Like when I'm going, oh, what a bummer, physics. How do I get myself to feel respect? Did I understand what you said about respect in the wrong way? Or should I forget all the feelings and start with the constraints and magic circle part? Or is there something I'm missing here? And then she signed the note, thank you, Thalia, 18. So I was kind of like addled, but, but, but very much primed by this, this week of thinking about, but not necessarily making much progress on a similar concern with my own daughter. And the moment felt like completely surreal, like it had been lifted from a, from a screenplay. So I sat down and I was like, what do I say? I have to respond to this. I don't respond to every email, I will admit, but this was one I was gonna respond to. So I, was, I started typing. I, I won't pretend to have like, some kind of a magic formula for this, I responded, and, and I think one of the problems is believing in magical formulas or numbered lists of foolproof methods or whatnot. The problem, of course, is that that's exactly what people want, as I previously mentioned. One of the things I try to get at in the book, I expressed to Thalia, is that when you try to build an activity solely from your own desires and feelings, it ends up becoming weaker and less stable. Our minds are just poor foundations for action, at least taken alone, I wrote. So you're probably unlikely to conjure respect for physics just by willing it in your head. And then I sort of stopped at the keyboard and I was really struggling to find tractable advice. You know, like, did I even know what I was talking about? Uh, you know, one answer I surmise would be to, to search her mind for worldly things that might start to make physics something she could take seriously, but that, that's kind of the opposite of, of the sentiment I just expressed about why the mind alone was an insufficient constraint uh, for doing so. So finally I settled there. I was like, okay, well, respect doesn't mean fealty, I finally wrote. It, it, it's not like physics has got it right and you, Thalia, have it wrong. Respect really means treating things for what they are and not trying to change them to match your preconceptions. Physics is physics, and there's not much one can do about it. 
Sure, yes, perhaps there are examples that might make the material clearer or study methods that might be more tractable. It's probably worth exploring those, I suggested. But it's also worth recognizing that physics might not be a thing you will ever enjoy doing for whatever reason. So I'm sorry if there are um, physicists in the room or on the horn today, but uh, what I ended up doing was telling Thalia to consider just powering through the subject in the least possible time and with the lowest possible effort. And that you know, if she were, were studying to be an engineer or a scientist, then eventually she would have to come to terms with her trials with physics in order to thrive. But if not, then maybe it would be fine not to worry about it too much. Uh, the point here, I told Thalia, is that it's not physics that demands respect, but the specific system that is her and physics together. The thing that incorporates Thalia and physics and all the other participants that went undisclosed in a brief email she sent to a stranger. You know, the confluence of her interests, abilities, and predilections merged with topics and entities and things in the world, they produce different and unique opportunities for action. The, the constraints aren't operating like just in physics, where it's the key term, or in studying, or in like time management, or whatever. They're also in Thalia, and her schedule, and, and her upbringing, and everything else around her. And recognizing the actors in that system, and then developing approaches to living with them, among them, that's the, the idea I really had in mind with play. That the, the constraints aren't there for you to overcome, or even to like, First, they're simply there to acknowledge. That's the respect part. And, and eventually, to learn to tolerate, which is another uh, kind of respect. Now, game designers sometimes deploy this idea of the, the magic circle, which is a phrase that she mentioned in that email. And it's a concept borrowed from the Dutch anthropologist Johan Hoitzinger as a name for the special place where a game or other forms of culture in Hoitzinger's thinking uh, take place. It, it's like a way of, of circ circumscribing the materials at play. And that circumscription both defines a boundary in which uh, we, we kind of uh, are willing to take on the absurdity of play, and also a border that contains its contents. It creates an excuse to carry out the exercise of play. But it's easy to forget one of the materials inside that circle, a really important one. And that material is you. You are also one of the terms in the game. And circumscribing a set of limitations always implicates you within it. Now my daughter, the, the younger version, who invented the game with the mall tiles, she kind of like seamlessly accepted and put into practice the features of her form and disposition in the context that she was in. She knew she was small, uh, she had to move quickly to keep up with me. She may have remembered uh, getting lost in a, 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 a large farmer's market the year before and concluded that clinging fast to me was advisable. She knew she wasn't in control because children know that they're not in control. They're living in an adult's world. Uh, she knew she was bored and wanted to find something to do. She hadn't chosen to come on this errand with me. All of those features contributed to her circumstance and her invention, the, the kind of equivalent of chits and dice or balls and nets in her game. But for Thalia, when she faced a similar circumstance, it just didn't occur to her to imagine herself as a part of it. The world somehow stopped around her body and mind, and she became just a passenger in it, like, like, like I was on the airplane. The only idea, or at least the first idea that she could think of, was that something was wrong with her, that she needed to alter her own capacities to tolerate at physics, or, 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 or even to put my idea of play to use. So about a week passed, and Thalia wrote back to me with her results. Been at it for a week now, and I figured I could use time as my go-to constraint, because all the games have time limits, except, except games like Monopoly, a subtle dig at Monopoly, the worst board game. So to get through physics, I just start my stopwatch and see how fast I can do it. Other things I don't want to rush through, I take my time, and in that way I don't have to worry about how I feel for the task at all. Now, but again, I don't want to pick on the physicists. Physics is just an accidental example. For every Thalia suffering through physics, there is a Thea struggling to tolerate uh, a literature. The point isn't what's worth spending time on. It's not about the content, but that the most productive approach for Thalia in the then present moment for her might have involved shirking the subject. Okay, two months or so passed and the college uh, acceptance deadlines loom. 
So we're like, you know, spring 2020 now. And my daughter came into my, my bedroom with an idea. Having talked with all the programs about their fall plans, given the, the descent of the COVID-19 pandemic, she felt unconvinced that an acting conservatory program would be possible, or at least normal enough to be worthwhile during the pandemic. And this turned out to be a, a very correct uh, uh, intuition. And furthermore, as I mentioned, she was already kind of worried about a four-year academic program and all its coverage requirements. And she said, quite, quite incisively, I don't want to spend a bunch of money and time and end up uh, not finishing, she told me. Uh, but there was an alternative. There was an alternative at hand, given the materials at hand. She actually had been taking these uh, dual enrollment classes at Georgia State University, uh, which are classes, college classes open to high school students. A and those courses would count toward a degree were she to matriculate there at that institution. Um, and they could also transfer, actually, but we'd learned from my older son, who had also done this high school dual enrollment program, that transfer credit is kind of a crapshoot because other institutions may, um, they may count it for graduation, but not toward degree requirement. These are all the, those of you who are higher ed educators, you know how many tricks, how many secrets we have that we don't tell people, and they arrive and we're like, actually. <laughs> anyway, this is one of these like secret logistics things you only know after it's too late. So, so my daughter reasoned, like, like, why not just kind of cash in on her banked credits, go full time during the summer when she couldn't do anything at all anyway, it was a pandemic, and just try to power through, get through as fast as possible, and then move to a new city where she could focus on getting acting work or trying to just to, to try at a new place. And that seemed like a great idea, but then of course, you know, one pandemic summer became two, and that only accelerated the acceleration. So she did another full summer term of classes. Um, and then we, we moved to, to St. Louis, I moved to Washington University, and she actually moved up here to the city um, and uh, uh, got cast as a, uh, as, as a lead in a short film, and she graduated last uh, December, and she's just kind of doing her thing now. So it was, I mean, I don't know if it was, it, it was, it was good for her because it's what happened and what she worked out. Now you might correctly observe that one can't replace a four-year college experience with a two-year one, especially when done remotely. Um, and that's all true, but you can do the latter instead of the former, given different circumstances. And lots of people don't have the opportunity to do the former in the first place, do they? So I'm not making like prognostications here about the future of education. I certainly don't think an offering like mine or Columbia's is in danger of falling out of favor. I wrote a whole feature for The Atlantic at the height of the pandemic on the lasting power of the college experience. I'm just telling you a story about how one person, a person who happens to be very close to me and who I know something about, made choices, difficult ones, in a situation by taking into account as many of the properties of that situation that she could admit to herself were present given the current circumstances. And it's not like it's all roses either. What she's trying to do is really hard. Just living in this city is almost impossible. In Play Anything, I, I wrote about a concept that I called ironoia. Um, which is my name for the mistrust of things. And I, I characterize it in the book as this widespread cultural illness. I'm not gonna go into it into detail, but I distinguished it from paranoia, from which I borrowed the term, because paranoia, that's the distrust of people. That's when you think someone's out to get you. Uh, but you can be, you know, you're, you're ironoid at things. Something, something's, you know, it, 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 it's, gonna, it's, it's gonna disappoint me, right? But you can also have ironoia of people too and their distinguishing features and, and, and that's not dehumanizing. And we're, we're often kind of ironoid of ourselves. There, there's, there's, there's something difficult about noting which of our own predilections, talents, weaknesses and circumstances are, are real and present and therefore facilitate and constrain our natures and the possibilities that are available to us. And most often we kind of just try to reject those limitations, right? Like you can do anything if you can dream it. Uh, and, and sometimes we do that out of aspiration. Sometimes we do it out of shame or, or embarrassment. Sometimes we do it out of ignorance. Sometimes we do it out of the presumption that those limitations are just like temporary inconveniences that we will soon throw off by grit or, or resilience or what other horrific pop psych concept is currently circulating. Um, all of which uh, leads us to uh, uh, Martin Heidegger, unfortunately. So uh, this is the Martin Heidegger portion of the talk. I'm sorry in advance. The philosopher uh, Ian Thompson has devoted much of his career to an interpretation of education 
through the work uh, of Heidegger as a process of Heideggerian disclosure. Uh, what a thing or person is and does depends on its context. And that context is like all inclusive. It covers everything, the material circumstances of its creation and operation and decay, the social, political, and economic circumstances in which it's embedded. Uh, and Thompson, in his thinking about this, cites what turns out to be a, like a super uncharacteristically lucid line from Heidegger on this topic, at least by Heidegger standards, which is this one. To learn means to make everything we do and allow answer to whatever essentials address us at a given time. It's, it's still like pretty wonky, I'm sorry, the translation too, but like for Heidegger, pretty clear. The idea is that as people thrown into a world that they neither chose nor designed, which is the condition Heidegger names Dasein, we are constantly contending with the process of world disclosure, another Heidegger term that we don't need to worry about too much. So Thompson, who's following a long line of philosophers who's focused on the utility of, of disclosure, of this philo philosophical idea of disclosure as a compass bearing for personal and social action, he takes that goal as fundamental to education. That as selves, we disclose our own being by becoming who we are. And as educators, we help others come into their own, as Thompson put it, puts it. So like to be yourself is to be you, but even more so. By learning to disclose being, Thompson writes, we human beings learn to come authentically into our own. But like, how? You know, how do we know when we are authentically coming into our own? And this authenticity business, which is, is you know, everywhere all throughout Heidegger and, 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 and all of existential philosophy, it's a messy problem. As a received cultural value, authenticity often gets contrasted with social pressure. To be oneself is to refuse to conform to expectations set externally. You know, like, I'm just being my authentic self, someone might post on Instagram, even though they're doing like absolutely the opposite of being their authentic self by doing so. The problem is that um, these external expectations, among so many other things, they're, they're not so easily separable from a sense of self. Like the thing that one thinks to think, let alone do, gets structured by the circumstances surrounding you. Otherwise, you'd be in some sort of like isolated ice world on your own, right? Those materials are also circumscribed in that kind of magic circle like arena. And the disconnect between our nature and our knowledge of that nature infects authenticity as a principle. So like being authentic tends to involve an ideal of oneself rather than that self's reality. So if you say like, I'm just being my authentic self, it's less a historical record and more of a projection or an aspiration. Like here is a depiction of how I long to represent myself, at least for now. And despite what people think they mean when they talk about it, authenticity is actually not some closely held deep and clear position about what someone really knows uh, about themselves at all. Now in Heidegger, if you're, if you're the kind of person who cares about this stuff, in Heidegger, the word that usually gets translated as authentic is eigentlich, which means something like real or true or actual. And you know, in contemporary vernacular, vernacular as we hear on Instagram or over you know, after work drinks or whatever, the actual self isn't the same as the authentic one, is it? Like when you compare them side by side, you know that authenticity is dress up. It's, it's you in you cosplay. But then if you like try to do the work of finding your actual self, it's much, much harder because it, it doesn't just involve identifying the essential qualities that underlie your own capacities and shortcomings. It also involves constantly reorienting those properties to all of the other people and objects and materials and circumstances that you might encounter. And all of those things are moving and swelling and contracting and coming and going. So Thompson, the, the Heideggerian, puts this in terms of, of your or my ontological being. That means what it, what it means for us to exist as individuals. In each specific situation, this is Thompson now, we respond ontologically when we learn to discern the inchoate outlines of something that is struggling to emerge into the light of intelligibility. And by giving a name 
to this emerging phenomenon. We help bring it more fully into being. To be is to become what you are already, but more so. So I see a mirror of my own experience and interests in Thompson's move here because this idea of like discerning the inchoate outlines of something sure feels akin to that circumscription of the magic circle, that thing that we do when we play. Before we can ask what something can do, we have to know, even provisionally, what it is, what it's capable of, in what other things it's involved. But like once again, if we're being honest, that just leads us to more of these like how the hell do we do that kinds of questions. And that was the question that Thalia raised. You know, How can I see the things with which I might play? And all I did was remind her that she herself was a part of her own situation. But that, that's just one example. You know, for this method to work, uh, I can't have to reply to emails from the select few who bother after finding some value in the material uh, 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 to, to write them. You know, obviously I had done something wrong in not having uh, uh, executed better. And, you know, also because as someone who's interested in a lot of things, like even people who work with more literal materials, not abstractions like the, you know, your internal self or something, like crafting physical things, even then we don't really know what we're dealing with. Like until you know, I have a woodworking hobby like everybody does these days, you know, all these things you picked up during the pandemic. Um, until you know how the decorative symmetry of a book matched panel like this one is created from two halves of a ripped lumber board, like how would you know to know it? How would you even recognize it? And this issue just recurs endlessly. All of my previous interests in the history of ideas and culture are kind of accidents in the collision between recognition and history. Like intellectually, you might know or you might be able to be taught that reading ancient epic in codex form is kind of a lie because these works were reconstructed uh, for, uh, from parts created for recitation and that recitation was made possible by the structure of meter and the way that mnemonic epithets uh, are slotted into the openings of those meters. Or I'm like a, a big fan of photography and you know, these are uh, photos, uh, uh, impressionistic photos by Brassai and, and like, like the, the reason these pictures work is because they're plate film that was exposed for long periods of time and Brassai would go out on like, like uh, rainy evenings um, when the, the, the mist in the air would act as a kind of natural diffusion filter, which is what creates that kind of dreamy quality, which is kind of the, the whole aesthetic payload uh, of the images. Or, or if we play this out a little bit further, like the small size of the rangefinder camera, the 35 millimeter rangefinder camera, is what made what we call street photography, such as uh, a Cartier-Bresson style photography, uh, possible, because you could kind of hide the apparatus. That's what makes it possible to capture this moment. Or the same thing, this is a, a uh, a, f a famous image um, by a Swiss photographer named Robert Frank. And you, you just can't make this image today because that sort of like ethereal glow around the, um, the jukebox is, is essentially created by the, um, the old lens designs and they're, they're, they, were, they were uncoded and there was a lot of, uh, of reflections bouncing around between the elements. And so you know, we've, we've eliminated a lot of that from the aesthetics of photography now and instead you get these kind of crisp, sharp images. Or I, I do work on the history of computers, especially the Atari, and it's such a weird machine, like the, the lack of video memory in, in this machine that had 128 bytes of RAM, which required its programmers to interface with the television on a scan line by scan line basis, which produced kind of accidentally this, this sort of like weird horizontal aesthetic in the games, and, you know, and like this is Barnstormer, you see those, that, like that like sunset, which is produced by the fact that you have to change the lines from from scan line to scan line, and same thing in Pitfall. That, that kind of accident sort of, like it was part of what introduced horizontality as an aesthetic experience in, in, uh, in video games. I, like, how would you know any of this unless you already knew? How would you know the materials you have to work with either as an understanding or a creative? There's kind of a paradox in, in play, which is that it's, it's an activity of freedom, but the freedom it affords only arises once the possibilities are reduced rather than expanded. That's the whole business with working within constraints. But then there's a paradox in the paradox, which is without visibility into the limitations, their meaning as constraints d doesn't exist. It, it, it just can't be seen. It's almost like playing a game whose rules nobody explained, and then they're like, well, why aren't you doing it right? I, I don't even know what's going on. 
And you know, like conventions can help, like if we have, you know, we have genre and art, or we have material and craft, but as I just explained, like the need for enculturation still arises, you know, the inevitable withdrawal of convention into the, the, the invisible uh, ground of custom. And I've tried many ways to, to like make sense of this. Like I, I you know, as, a, as a, 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 a living a prior life as a, a literary scholar, I looked at the Ulipo, this weird collective of creators that invented or revived constraints as a model for how we might appreciate and work within them. So things like the palindrome, you know, a text that reads the same forward and backward, or a, a more esoteric uh, constrained invention called the lipogram, uh, which is a, a text written without certain uh, letters. This is a famous uh, novel, La Disparition, uh, a novel written with, without the letter E. And these are delightful, but they're also kind of indulgences. Like you can't just run away from the world and make up new constraints every time the old ones get boring uh, or irritating, like, like some kind of uh, itinerant. And I, I know this seems bizarre, but this happens all the I went to get a bagel um, uh, uh, just bef this morning before it. And like, you know, it's like the soup Nazi thing that always, you walk, you're not like sure, like how does this place work with the, oh, I, I order here, but the coffee you order, like of course you idiot, you order the coffee over there, right? Like we run into this thing all the time, right? And carrying out play, it involves collecting and, and, and reinterpreting all of these materials, all this stuff, all this garbage that we find in the world, such as, you know, the ones my daughter found in the mall or during the pandemic, the ones that, that, that Thalia found amid her, her physics homework. And it's really only the privileged that, that get to work outside of those boundaries of, of convention, outside uh, magic circles that are truly magic, for, for example, by outsourcing their bagel uh, 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 pickup to someone else. Okay, so if you've, um, you've been at this for a minute now, if you looked at your watch, you're, you might have started worrying a bit. Like it kind of feels like this lecture is nearing its end and um, Bogus hasn't really given us an answer to this question of how to learn uh, playfully or, or even uh, how to play. And like I'm, I'm, I'm aware of this, I'm kind of right there with you. And I wish I felt, I wish I felt satisfied with those kinds of answers. I desperately wish I could write like the pop psychology self-help book, you know? Like something, how to live playfully, the seven proven steps to success in work, love, family, and everything. I'm, I'm sure my, my literary agent would like me better if I could do this too, and, 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 and my bank account would uh, as well. And you know, you, you like base it on some series of small-scale psychological experiments, like N equals 10, kind of experiments and those would produce like a journal publication or two and we could shift the frame of this work from philosophy to behavioral science and I could tell you this is the way to learn playfully and we'd be done, right? And then I would sign books on the way out. And I don't know, like maybe I'll get over myself and find a way to, to do that. Maybe it's a terrible idea and I need to stick with it. But in any case, I worry that such a plan can't ever work, at least for me, because play is an aesthetic practice. It's, it's born from an ontological circumstance. And, and this is why it's kind of easier, at least for a certain sense of easy, for Ian Thompson to go like full metal Heidegger on the, on the problem. Like at least in that context, the conversation can end at the abstraction, at the philosophical level. And then it's up to the rest of us to figure out what to do with it. But he does give us some clues. Uh, at one point, Thompson calls his Heideggerian educational program an ontological midwifery. Um, philosophers, right? Like they really get the best job. A, a process of bringing the beings among us even more into the being of their being. If you hang out with Heideggerians, this is the way that they talk, you know. Uh, but all he really means is making people, even you maybe, more what they already are. And that feels like play. That just feels exactly like what play feels like to me. It's not a process of invention or innovation. It's not like a divergent thinking that expresses creativity. But, but a converging one, one that unearths the elements that we can use, that we can make use of, that we can, that we can find use for, that we can find tolerance for. So, so like the tool that we seek in achieving this goal isn't the, like the bullet pressing us beyond our current circumstances, which is very much one of the ways that people have always talked about games and education. Like learning sucks, let's make it fun, let's pour the chocolate on the broccoli. It's not that. It's, it's, like, it's like an auger drilling deeper into the circumstances that we already encounter, especially the ones that we find intolerable and, and kind of wretched. And I don't know if I've succeeded, but I, I, 
I've tried my best in, in my work, including today in front of you, to try to model something along the lines of that practice. You know, the, the process is the practice. And the process involves surfacing and displaying the, the materials at hand, holding them in our hands, smiling and furrowing at them, but above all being just brutally, mercilessly honest about what it is that we've dug up and, and what those relics and what that refuse suggests we might do under the circumstances. There's, there's a phrase I think about a lot, under the circumstances. It, it should get a lot more respect than it does. It, it's, it's always used with like a kind of tone of concession or tragedy. Like, well, you did what you could under the circumstances. Like, as if there is ever anything other than the circumstances. Like, which circumstances were you hoping for? The ideal ones that you imagined in your fantasy of your authentic self? Wouldn't it be better to acknowledge and respond to the actual circumstances? even when seeking to improve one's lot in relation to them, rather than lamenting them or, or rejecting them or ignoring them. The circumstances, it turns out, are all we ever get. Thank you very much for your attention today. All right, so we have time for some questions. Yeah, good. Good luck with your questions. <laughs> if you can, there'll be a microphone that can be kind of passed out, I think, over there so that the online people can hear the questions as well. Questions, comments, thoughts on, on play, on the circumstances, on any of these things? It's kind of weird, I know. Like, while you're thinking of your questions, I'll just say, like, I don't know. Like, I'm just trying to share some ideas with you. So even if you just have, like, a riff, you know, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. It's, yes, yeah, for, the, for the online audience. So um, I've been playing Wordle. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one thing you said is about your being as you play, if I'm understanding it correctly, sort of um, manifests itself in the way you play, potentially, or you become more aware of some of your own um, personality or the way you think and then they, they sort of extend themselves into the way you play. I don't know if that kind of makes sense. So what I've been doing is I have a little family group around it uh -huh. on, yeah. on WhatsApp and uh -huh. every day and so I've been adding rules yep. to it. Like, like I tell them, okay, let's, what word are you starting with every yeah. day? So then I came up with new rules for the game. And I said, okay, the one who wins then gets to choose the starting word for the next day. And so it's evolved into this social as well as, and then I find myself like the way I play the Wordle game is different from others, how yep. they think about mm -hmm. it. And we're trying to extract like, why did you choose this first word? And then what is your second yep. word? And so it's become more of an extension, I guess, of the way we are. Yeah. Is, is that one of no, the No, uh, great comments. I mean, it's Thank great you. comments. Like, I, I, what I can say about it, there's a, there's a couple really interesting kernels in this. One is that um, it's, a, it's a great example of this, this thing I call the paradox of play. The, um, we have this sense that if we could only do what we want, then we would, we would be satisfied. Just let me do what I want. But we, of course, have no idea what we want. And then when games come along, they're like, no, like, you can't do whatever you want. That would be preposterous. Do exactly what the system allows. And that could be enforced by its materials or, or, by, or by rules. But then you, you very quickly realize, wait, I, 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 I also get bored with that in a way. I'm, I'm stuck in this rut of using the same Wordle start word. And it's not, that, it's not that I feel ashamed of it or something, it's rather that something more seems possible here. And so then by introducing more limitations, rather than fewer, more limitations, well, let's not start with the same word. I'm gonna tell you what to start with and you've gotta deal with that improvisation. That makes it more interesting somehow, which feels like it doesn't, it, we, should be, we should feel more boxed in because we have fewer freedoms, but having those fewer freedoms uh, somehow magically gives us more, right? Uh, and 
one of the things I'm intrigued by, and, and this like shift I've been struggling with as a game designer over the last two, three decades, is that how do we get that out? This is the question that we've been asking over and over again, since the 60s at least, and, and much longer than that. Um, how do we bottle it? How do we take that thing that games offer and pour it on other, other experiences, work, learning, whatever? Uh, but that, that also kind of doesn't work, right? What you have to do is treat those other things in the same way that you're treating the, 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 the playful experience uh, of the game. You don't want your um, job as an actuary to have Wordle in it, whatever that would mean. What you want is to be as int interested in it as you are in, in Wordle in that way. And to do that, well, how would you go about it? Well, by doing the same thing with whatever that circumstance is that you described doing with Wordle, which is like really looking deeply and earnestly and seriously at its, like what is this thing capable of? What else can I do with it? Turning it over in your hands, um, making suggestions, ah, oh, that didn't quite work or that didn't, like well, now I'm gonna make this, this, this revision. Including, I've given up on playing Wordle, but I did the same thing, including abandoning it, right? Like, oh, maybe this isn't for me. I'm going to draw a different circle around a different set of experiences. So I think it's really insightful. And the, and the, and the second observation I would make from your observation is that one of the reasons we have this anxiety about games, about their utility or what they're for, is because they, they're kind of useless. They're sort of point, they're, like, they're like the place where we practice, where we exercise that muscle of embracing constraint and limitation. But then we don't do the work of taking that muscle that we've built and exercising it in the, in, in the world. Immediately after Wordle became massively popular earlier this year, first thing I saw, I tracked this, I have to, you know, uh, it's like, w is Wordle making you smarter? You know, like, can Wordle make you a better, you know, executive or something? Actual stories like that, right? It's like, no, it's just a, it's just a silly game. Like, that's all it is, but it's delightful, right? And that's the, that's the kind of thing we want from educational experiences, from our, you know, from our, our, our work life, from our family life. Uh, from all the relations, we want them to feel good and delightful, um, and 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 earnest, and exactly what they are in in that way that that, that Thompson, the Heideggerian, identifies that we're trying to to kind of bring out in, in ourselves and others. Thank you. So maybe you can overlay um, your notion of, 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 of games and learning on, on this little thing. I, I tag along with my wife from time to time. She's an early childhood specialist, uh, zero to three, actually, uh -huh. and, uh, and I'm not. But I saw this game perform. There were squares, triangles, and circles of different colors and different sizes. And what the kids were supposed to uh, get out of this is, you know, it's, it's learn a little bit about attributes. Sure. And the game is what comes next. Mm -hmm. You don't tell them the rules. Mm -hmm. You put a triangle that's this big in front of them, you say, what comes next? Some of them will say, well, another triangle. Some mm -hmm. of them will say a square of the same color. Mm -hmm. And some of them say, you know, a circle or, or whatever. And some of them will say, well, it's another triangle because that one's lonely, you know, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and things like that. Yeah. But it gives you a lot of insight. Um, they get excited about it. Uh, it's all about taking their emotions and 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 and, and really concatenating them into a into an affect, right? Right. And, and and that seems to be what you're saying here is 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 this emphasis on affective domain and how um, in any context, whether it's you know something like physics, which which in my view is really fun, but um, you know, no, yeah, right, uh, right. It it is, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I taught nuclear engineering in the Navy for a long time to 18-year-olds who had to get the equivalent of a master's degree in nuclear engineering, right? And they had to do things to make the make neutrons sort of their personal little friends, right? You know, and, and all of that. So anyway, let me shut up and. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, no, there's a lot in this too. I think the um, one thing it makes me think of is there's this this. The sentiment that people have about kids, uh, especially very young kids, which is that they are—they um, have not yet been poisoned by by adult life. They have not yet been ruined by the um, 
the constraints we, 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 we impose on them by our blinkered way of looking at the world. And so they are f kind of free thinkers. And we often associate play with, 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 with children um, or the, the freest form of play. Maybe we're trying to recover it, maybe we're lamenting it, but there's that, that kind of uh, uh, association, right? And when you watch kids do pattern matching, kind of things like that, and it's not necessarily the case for your wife's example, but when I've seen these sorts of things happen, we, we tend to treat like the, oh, the, the triangle is lonely, like how adorable that they would think that, like um, that's delightful, I'm glad I experienced that, now let's sort of dispose of it and go back to the work of, of doing geometry or whatever it's supposed to be for, right? Um, whereas what's really interesting about that exercise isn't, isn't necessarily what the kids can learn, but what the adults administering it can learn from them, like, oh God, like, you know, which is what we then go home and worry about. Man, like, I wish I had that in me still, that I could, that I could think or see that way, you know? So that's one, it's just like a thought. Um, a Co second, yeah, go ahead. C constraint very often is more about expanding the attributes sure. around something right. than, than, than right. restricting it. Yeah. The other thing, and this is a little more unintuitive, I think, the other thing about kids is that um, we think of them as, as these free spirits, but much like the paradox of play stuff, it's actually quite the opposite. Like they, they are, are completely at the mercy of the world. You know, they're, 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 they're small and are constantly looking up and can't can't reach things. Uh, they they can't you know they they conversing with people's knees. They're they're taken to do this exercise for whatever reason they don't know why but they didn't choose it. And and so that idea of being subject to to the world not in a, like an oppressive sense but like the world is there it's acting on me. I got to find a way to deal. Like that is endemic yeah. uh, to childhood. And then and then you get older and more like even slightly more powerful and you begin to think that you have control, and then you get angry when you don't, like you're trying to order bagel or whatever, when in fact you're just never, you were, you were never in control and never are, and the absurdity of the universe is always kind of acting on you, right? Um, I mean, not to make it too existential or anything, but I do think that, that that attitude, you know, whether you're Thalia trying to get through physics or the nuclear engineer who's committed to it, like. There's something fundamentally preposterous about what we're talking about, which is why games are such a useful uh, lens into them, because they're stupid. They don't make any sense. There's no point in doing them. They're wastes of time. All of those things that we've tried for decades to sort of pretend aren't the case, like, no, like, this is a serious bill where we can make games about politics, like I used to do. Okay, that's fine. But also there's something about the waste of timiness of them that is like their molten core. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. We have time for one more, but one, one more quick one, I think, and then we're going to have the break. So it <laughs> puts the pressure on, doesn't it? Oh, I try to. Um, would you say it's about creating choices that lead to satisfaction? I thought about the IKEA principle. When you go into these big stores, you have just a limited um, pile of choices. Right. And other um, stores have like these, they're throwing you with stuff. Um, yeah. And my takeaway is a bit like you have to. Um, um, need the um, the expectation to meet the expectation, and so you um, yeah meet the sector satisfactory right. of the uh, client. I say. I mean, one of the one of the reasons I one of the reasons I I do this stuff the way I do now is to try to show you how messy everything is. You know, because you're right about the IKEA principle. I'm familiar with it. I know what you mean. But then think about what ha I just just in IKEA last week. Right, you go into the <laughs> IKEA and you're like. I know what's happening here. <laughs> and then they don't have stock anyway because they can't get their logistics in order even despite two years into a pandemic. And you've got your phone, so you're like, well, I mean, is this what I want even? And then, oh, it is what I want, but they don't have it in the color. And the, you know, the employees are all completely truculent and absent. You have no idea why that is like a management problem or something. And so, so it just all melts so fast that, um, that when, you, when you start erecting walls, you have to realize that they're, um, they're made of sugar, you know? Um, they, they're just always subject um, to being reincorporable into something else. And the, like the moment we think we've got it, then people acclimate to it as well. So I don't think it's a wrong uh, uh, sentiment. It's a, good, it's a good compass bearing, maybe. But then it's, it's in motion, it's like an organism. How do we work with it? Oh, it's changed, it's changed. The last couple of years have shown us that. That you know, even today now, like we're in this room because we feel like sort of like safe enough to 
be doing this together and it, some people are online and, we, and we're, not, we're not quite sure either and we're wearing masks and we're checking, all of that, like that's, a, that's, a, that's just forever now, right? Is this, this kind of weird goopy organism that's constantly shifting and, 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 and fusing and merging. Um, and that's also related to, what, what, to the child's play thing too, right? Oh, like now, you know, now you're a dragon, now you're, now you're a robot. Um, that sort of willingness to adjust and pivot um, maybe is more necessary than ever for the satisfaction to be possible. Thank you. Okay, well, thank, thanks so much. I think that wraps thank up so the time. Thank coming. you so really much, Ian. It. Thanks for being here. Um, I should be around for the break a little bit. Okay, great. So if you want to talk more with Ian, he'll be around for the break. So uh, he's going to stick around for a little bit. And I know you'll be here Friday morning for the panel as well. Um, so he'll be around through the week. So uh, great to see everybody here again. And we've, we've uh, had our first session and we've got a break coming up. And then after that, we move on to parallel sessions. So uh, coffee breaks right outside for those of you who are here. For those of you who are not physically here, it's wherever you got it. And we'll see you back here in uh, half an hour. <laughs>